bring it up here. I didn't get that anyway. I was just reminded, uh, I, see, I see these four gentlemen standing here, and I was like, the job of a church is to raise up warriors for the next generation. And I see four warriors standing here, and I just love to see that. So, yeah, you, can, yeah, you know your job is to kick right. me if I'm saying something I shouldn't. Right. So, I should pick somebody with longer legs. <laughs> So if you have your Bibles today, you will only be in one book, and that is Ecclesiastes. Um, I was just reminded too, you know when you have something break down on the farm, and a mechanic happens to roll into the field, who you know is good at his job, you're like, oh, everything's going to be okay. And the same thing if you have some electrical problem, and you know an electrician, and they show up, and you're like, it doesn't matter what goes wrong. I have the people here that can help me. It's going to be okay. And I was just, as I stepped into the side room this morning, I was just reminded um, of Pastor Jake. And I was like, wow. I just love hanging out, being around him. And it just sometimes reminds me that no matter what I'm thinking, it just he's got a calming presence. So I just appreciate that, Pastor Jake. And, and uh, just the life that you've led is a testament, I guess, it means a lot to me. So the title for today is, What is Our Purpose? So I'm not sure if you all have it figured out, especially the younger crew, but sometimes you'll roll into middle age and you'll be like, I am not sure that I have this all figured out. And so I hope there's more people like me that sometimes just stop and, and we pause in the middle of all of our busyness and we wonder, what is, what is our purpose? What are we striving for? So I had a message in preparation for the ranch rodeo down at the clear, uh, but felt it was not for here. Um, so Friday morning, I'm not sure when I talked to Joe, um, but I just decided that I, I needed to do something else. Um, and I, I did have a message, so everywhere I speak, I have one message that I bring that it, it, it will happen. And I wanted to bring that message um, today but it, it takes a lot of work to organize it and to prepare it, and it would have took an extra trip and, and grab us at Worsley, so I knew I couldn't make it out and prepare that. So hopefully you'll have me back one time and I can do that message for you, because it is on my heart and I, and I would love to. It just takes a little bit more, more planning than I have the time for. Um, so I was in the house after I talked to Joe, I think the next morning, and I don't, I don't force. I don't force writing. I don't, I, I do, if God has something to say, he's either going to give it to me, or I'm going to roll in here one day and be like, I have nothing to do, because God wants it that way. So I started, and I, I, uh, I don't know if there's any guys like me, uh, sometimes I have a problem cleaning. So instead of having a mess all over the place, I make little piles everywhere. They're my piles. Melissa loves my piles. So once in a while, she's like, you should clean up your piles. So the next morning, I think after I talked to Joe, I was I was just walking around the house and I was I was figuring out where the Lord was gonna lead me, if anywhere, and I, I stumbled across a pile and I was like, I should clean this up. And so I'm, I'm leading through the pages and I'm like, garbage, garbage. I wonder why I let the pile get so big. And then all of a sudden I come to a little piece of paper and it had uh, and it must have been in, in that particular pile for a while, because um, I don't remember it. And on it was written Ecclesiastes 12. 13. Does anyone know who wrote Ecclesiastes? Solomon. Solomon. Who is Solomon to us? Okay, so sorry, but that's a great woman answer. <laughs> Give me a guy answer. What's the first thing a guy would think of when you think of King Solomon? Don't copy her. You're thinking of something else. Whoa! <laughs> okay, I never thought of that one, but that's true. That's true. Okay, and maybe maybe there's any more any guys in the Huh? Authority. Authority. Okay. The rich. Rich. That was me. Me and you think alike. It. Nothing else. So so King Solomon. Who is there? Rockefeller is the name we can think of that we hear. Elon Musk is a name that we can hear quite regular. Well, this King Solomon feller, I think he would still beat out everyone today. 
Now, I didn't do extensive research, but one article that I put to said that if you took King Solomon's wealth as listed, just in his listed assets, not his, what he would get every year, kind of as payments and stuff like that, he would pour gold like it was concrete. And so one article I read said, again, I don't know if it's entirely true, $2.1 trillion. So could be the richest man that still would have walked the face of the earth today. So we got some words from King Solomon in Ecclesiastes, one of the richest men to ever walk the face of the earth. So Ecclesiastes 12, 13, that's the whole story. Here is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. Does anyone aspire to the word duty? What does that word sound like to you? Give me some examples of, of duties that we have. Maybe duties to clean up our pile? You know? Somebody's got to do the laundry. Somebody's got to mow the lawn. Somebody's got to go to work. Feed the Pardon? Feed the family. Feed the family. Right? These are things. These are tasks. They're duties that we have to do. And I think sometimes in our lives, depending on our character, there is going to be some things that we like to do more or less. They might be at the bottom of that pile instead of the top of that pile. So here's what he is saying. Fear God and obey his commands. And, and I think sometimes in my own life, I can attest that I don't know, maybe I lose sight of fearing God. Maybe I lose sight of the big picture. And I, I wonder why that is. What gets in our way when we profess one thing and we let another thing replace it? I read that and I knew it was the premise for today, but I just wanted to read that one verse and let it sit. And so while I was walking around, I realized there was an online form that I needed to fill out for some farming stuff. And so I called the help desk line. I was on hold for 27 minutes. And, and if you know me, you would know my, Dave's looking at me, you would know my patient and bounding character. Melissa's like, know your line right now. That's it. I, I am not the most patient person. I have high expectations. So I was on hold for 27 minutes. And I said, ask my wife of the most grace-filled person, patient, that you will meet. And then I wrote, that's a lie. That's probably something I can work on daily. And uh, the next verse I scanned over as I was on hold past the 20-minute mark um, was uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 8. Does anybody know what that says? If you were just to get a couple of key verses out of Ecclesiastes, what's one thing that King Solomon says several times through that book? Everything is vanity or meaningless. Good thing I read that at the 20 minute mark. Like I somehow have to get through this form. But oh my goodness. So how do we balance the tasks we deal with on a daily basis, but keep focus on a godly perspective? Uh, I had to call back to the help desk because the first guy didn't know what he was talking about. And there was a glitch in the computer system, which I tried to tell him. So while well, I have my Bible open here, and my computer open here, and this feller is like, not with it. And I am like, everything is meaningless, but this still needs to happen, partner. And so then after I had to phone back and I spent, I was on hold for another 20 minutes. Anna, should you pray for patience? You should. And what's going to happen? The magic wand, you have patience? Or God might put you in a 57 minute queue of, you're probably going to have to learn the hard way. Or once in a while, I have to learn the hard way. I was told one time, I was a young mom, I'm very busy, and, and I was praying for patience. And I was asking, another person said to me, oh, he's just going to send you another child. I've never prayed for patience. Never prayed. That is so awesome. I love it. Oh. Uh, so after 20 minutes, um, when I spoke to the other fella, he was able to walk through step by step and we were able to pinpoint the problem. And, and then I just said here again, it was probably a good thing that I had my Bible open on the table while I was, I was doing this. And I'm like, once in a while, should in life just keep our Bible open. 
metaphorically or otherwise. If you've got a pack uh, in my gym bag, I always have a copy of the New Testament. I always try to, not all the time, carry a Bible in the vehicle under the premise of, I don't know if we're going to make it home. What would happen if you couldn't make it home? What would be the one thing that you would want to take with you? And, and probably one of my greatest fears, if I'm honest with you, is, God, have you imprinted your word on my heart enough that I could do without your written word? And to, to this day, I think I would be like, I would, I would, my family and my Bible would be the things that I would walk out the door with. It's so important to me. Um, as we balance the things of the world, what keeps us on purpose? Purpose-driven life, what is that purpose? If you're a note-taker, that will be the question for the day. Is our purpose to build more, to accomplish more, to do more stuff in less time? Will that be our story? Right, and as we're middle-aged and we're getting older, we can all look back, maybe, hopefully, with a little bit more wisdom in our lives, and maybe we'll be a little bit more like King Solomon, where we'll look behind us and we'll be like, vanity, meaningless. I wish I had to put more time into my kids, into my family, into relationships. So as I watch this row of young warriors up here, the world is in front of you guys. You will have to decide, right? I had the privilege of sitting with these two this week, and I was like, the world is in front of you. In another two weeks, we'll be making choices by yourself. How are we going to do that? As young couples, as middle-aged people, as the elderly, we need to take honest stock of where we see ourselves. Do you ever just read the Bible and shout out some real questions? Once in a while, I'll read stories in the Bible, and I'll just be like, God, I don't get it. And I was like, the one thing I didn't believe is God knows our heart. He sees our actions long before. And so for me, voicing some silly question, I trust God already. So I just felt it out. Ecclesiastes 1, 1 to 11. These are the words of the teacher, King David's son, who ruled Jerusalem. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, flowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea never fills. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. History merely repeats itself. It has been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here is something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. Why don't we remember what happened in the past? And in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. And as I read this, I'm like, wow, you're a downer. But then I actually got to thinking about how many things we allow in our lives that are maybe stuck on repeat. And they become years. And I don't know for some men, maybe I can't speak to women because I do believe in my heart. Oh, yeah, that was the thing. I was like, do you ever, do, is there any like builders, like there's some carpenters and some maybe guys that like to tinker in the shop and you build something. So you have this vision in your mind of how you want it to turn, but you, you sometimes just got to start. So that first thing that you build, what do you call it? Prototype. That's the word, right? Prototype. And so I'm forever building prototypes because I can never build anything. So I have a joke, it's not theologically correct, but I'm like, when God made mankind, what did he build first? You're already laughing because you know where I'm headed with this. That's not fair. He built man. He built Adam. That was his prototype. Again, not theologically correct, but it's funny. And then he's like, ooh, I need to do a little tweak here, a little tweak there, because the next one I roll off the line is going to be perfect. Okay? So there, there you go, all you women. That's the, we're the prototype, but you're just the end of the day. But it's cute as 
that story is to me, it just reminds me that we are created different, right? And sometimes, and, and not everybody can, can raise a family or do whatever, and there's things that come up along the way, but generally speaking, I look at women as a whole, and somehow the nurturing, God gave you this gift. And there's many men that can nurture too, but I, I, I do believe in my heart the primary gift that women have over men is this gift of nurturing and of love. And, and sometimes men, I don't know if it was because we were built first, but and, and through the fall, it was like you're going to be what? You're going to work the land, you're going to toil, you're going to, and, and sometimes we lose sight of the nurturing. And sometimes we lose sight of the relationship. And we get hung up building our own little empires. Because we think that that's all that matters to our family. We think that just our job is to put food on the table, to build that home, to do this. And then what happens is we roll along and there's maybe no time off. There's no, it's just work, work, work. And we feel that that's what we need to do to fulfill our role. And so men, I would encourage you as me, and Melissa reminds me often, relationships. Relationships. Don't forget the importance. Reprioritize our lives so we can get that up front. And I just said after I read Ecclesiastes 1, 1 to 11, the richest man on the planet definitely had a theme going on in that, in that story. Everything is meaningless. So we need to kind of grapple with that. One of these honest questions we look at uh, things through our experiences is our social upbringing, our geographical upbringing, our family, our school, maybe the country we live in. Uh, what about monetary? Sometimes if you're if you're growing up in a certain, um, I, I don't know the word for it, uh, family would have lots of money or less money or whatever. It's going to bring you up in a in a certain way. And so what I said is, it's easy to say Solomon grew up with a silver spoon in his hand. Right? He's King David's son. Or that's, that's my honest question. And so I said, well, we, uh, how's about when we make it there, we will just see if he was right. Do you, have, do you guys ever think that? Somebody's telling you advice or you're sharing stories on life, and somebody says to young people, if, if you go off track over here, um, right, if there's anybody dating, uh, things like that, if you go off track when we talk about intimacy, or we talk about these different things as a mom and dad, we're like, there, there can be issues. There can be consequences. And sometimes as young men or young women, I can only imagine, what do we say? I'll do the thing, and then I'll tell you if it was right or wrong. In the sight of whose eyes? Mine. Because we want to be what? Our own little G God. Sometimes... We don't want to press up into God's instructions or what he would call us as our duty to him. Obey my commands. Love me. And sometimes we struggle with that. Or I do. I do. I should always say that. Maybe nobody else does, but I do. <clears throat> if you live in town, this one's always been for me because I've probably walked this road. If you live in town, maybe you say to yourself, I'll just be happy if I live on an acreage. You get the acreage, and then all you want is a quarter. And then when you have a quarter, you want four. And when you have four, you look to the guy that has eight. And along the way, you keep saying to yourself, if I just, if I just have, I will be happy, I will be content, and then you get that other thing. King Solomon is pouring gold like concrete. And in the end, his life is a record of it didn't bring me contentment. He thought one wasn't enough, so he decided to have a thousand. That didn't work out for him well either. That was actually probably his biggest demise, in a sense. Right? As we think more will make us happy. <clears throat> I said, you name it. Oh, sorry. I wrote on the end of that, you could do that with uh, cars, with trucks, with houses. Whatever the thing is in your life that you think that you want more of, you name it and we can shift our primary focus to achieving it 
and it not bring the contentment that we thought it would. As I look at especially the young men in this group, this is the world in front of you. Especially with the digital age that we're in, you can't turn on your phone, you can't turn on the TV, you can't turn on nothing. And somebody's screaming at you what the next thing is that you need to be fulfilled. Right? So the world is pushing all this stuff, and lots of times this, this thing is, is sitting in the corner or sitting on the shelf. And then it needs to be front and center. In, in my life, I, I see that all the time. This last week, uh, I got to sit with a young couple and just talk about life. And they have so much wisdom in their young lives. And as we were chatting, I'm always self aware when we share our stories. What would ever want us to seek advice or wisdom from someone else? And not only seek it, but apply it blindly to our lives. Think of that on a personal level. Your mom, your dad, your grandparents who have been through much more than us. How many people did you take wisdom from and apply it without fault or deviation? Maybe sometimes we do. Again, I would have walked the road, I say, that when you read stories in the Bible, to insert yourself into that story and see who you were in that story. And when the Egyptians left, uh, or sorry, when the Israelites left Egypt, um, and there's the pillar of fire and the cloud, and the, yeah, the pillar of fire, and then the cloud, and you have Moses, and you have God clearly there, and you have the Egyptians, and you have... The, the Israelites, who in that story are you? So I, I thankfully, thank you God, I didn't find myself in that story as the Egyptians. I certainly wasn't trying to be like Jesus, so I wasn't in that category. I found myself, I wasn't Moses. I happened to be the Israelite. And what happened to the Israelite? Just didn't quite have a big life. Right? And so what was, what was, when they didn't have it figured out, what was the consequence for that? 40 year time out. 40 year time out. <laughs> Thankfully, I am now in my 40s. <laughs> and, and there's days that I sometimes feel like I just crossed through the wilderness. There's days I still think that I'm in the wilderness, trust me. But in that story, I was like, don't get hung up in the wilderness. God has bigger plans for each one of us. And we don't need to be stuck there. I keep thinking that. It's like, I think for Cleardale, the walk would be to like Valley View. It's somewhere like that. So you can envision that. Look it up later. So for 40 years, how long do you think it would take you to walk to Valley View? A week, if you put your mind on it. So we're going to start trucking off to Valley View. But along the way, we're going to go to the Dunbagan. And then we're going to circle around to the Peace River. And then we're going to come back around to the Dunbagan. And by the time we do that about 26 times, we're going to be like, I think I've been here before. <laughs> and I wonder if the Israelites thought that. And in our lives, when we have hardships, do we actually stop? I think, and, and like, again, broken record me, with especially Melissa here, why do I argue? Why do we argue with our spouses? Why do we, when we know the wilderness it's just, it's just going to circle back. I guarantee it. The quicker we could get off of that train, the better off we would be. And I don't know if it's because we, like, because I want to win, because my little brain shuts off. I said, what would be the result, Dave, if you filtered every question, every thought, every action through the Holy Spirit? Besides being perfect, let's just settle on the word amazing. And, and then we don't do it. And we know, right, Mark? We know we have access to it. And I'm like, I get more frustrated with myself when I shut my little brain off. Because it's like, do I want to just make a lap around the peace country again? I've seen the Dunbegan Bridge. Take me, take me further. <clears throat> Here we see King Solomon giving advice. And how many of us would simply say... When I have what he has, 
all that you have done. All that you know instead of him letting me know. I wanted to read, and I call reading, listening, like on audio books. If I said I read a book, likely that means I listened to it. I love audio. Um, to the whole of Ecclesiastes. Just to make sure you get the whole picture, right? Beforehand, afterhand, and, and that's kind of important. And so uh, I think I, I just kind of put my, my earbuds in and I laid down on the bed. And I remember that I was above in chapter 7. There's 12 chapters in Solomon, and I'm in chapter 7, and I think I remember kind of dozing off. And then I woke up in about chapter 5 of the following book. You're laughing because you know what's the next book. What? Song of Solomon. Woo! So I wake up with my eyes open, and I'm laying there in bed, and then I'm like aware, and then I'm starting to kind of fire on all cylinders, and then I'm listening, and I'm like, wait a minute. This is not the same genre that I fall asleep to. <laughs> it was a little steamy. And I was like, this is a different book than Ecclesiastes was. So that was kind of my funny moment. So I, I backed up and then I was able to re-listen to the, the rest of Ecclesiastes. Um, I want my life to have meaning and I want it to have purpose. But after you read Ecclesiastes, you realize it's true. We toil away trying to grow our own little empires, and we can lose sight of the bigger picture. And, and if I repeat myself for you, but I need to make a footnote here. Um, I did have a buddy in my life, he said, again, that's back to your way you were raised. Your family, lots of money, little money, where you grew up, where you went to school. And so he said the same thing. I am very self-aware when somebody looks at me and they would say, well, you seem to have something here and enough food over there. And, and, and then what would even make them want to trust my advice? They would say, when I have what you have, oh, maybe we can talk about it then. And so then as I look to King Solomon, I realize that that's so true. I can look to a bigger farmer where I farm in Worsley. I can look to a farmer where I come from in Bear Canyon and equally say when I have what they have, I let them know. And as I'm in middle age and we all went to funerals and passings of people we love, and, it, and it, I hope that we have a firm grasp on our zero to 80 years. I say this time and time again, there will be one of two things that happens at the end of your day. You can either choose to give away your little empire and all of your possessions. You can choose it, or it will be ripped from you. It will be taken from you. And that's a sobering thought for me. So as I live my life, are you prepared to walk away, Lord willing, with your family, Lord willing, maybe, He'll let me take my body. Or maybe God will say, how's about I just imprint this on him? I need to pray into that in my own life. <clears throat> From the first breath of salvation to our dying breath, are we on purpose? I read a quote from the Institute of C.S. Lewis. If you've ever read any of his books, he's just an amazing um, theologian in my mind. It said, the goal of discipleship is to become like Jesus himself, to think as he thought, to feel as he felt, to act as he acted, and to desire what he desired. I would probably have the, the toughest with the last, to switch my desires. I think if you actually started there, a lot of the other stuff would just naturally fall into place. And that was the end of the quote. Is that what we want? Do we want to get off the meaningless narrow ground of the world where so much is meaningless? What would it take for us to be provoked to stay on purpose of trying to think as Jesus would think, feel as he felt, to act as he acts, and to desire what he desires? The alternate, alternate plan to that is one of the world. The world would just as soon keep us in a slumber, to keep us indifferent to spiritual things. Quite frankly, that just makes me angry when I take the time to think about it. 
And it's funny, I needed to pen this to sometimes see it. Right? What we'll comes along in the world and we're living life and we're doing this and we're doing that, and we do. We become, we become part of it. And then all of a sudden, in the quiet, maybe, or in your study time or devotion or prayer or whatever it is, all of a sudden something pops out at you and you're like, whew, I was a long ways off track. I don't want to be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. I want to see things clearly. Because it makes me angry when I realize that the world pulled one over on me. What happened in the Garden of Eden? Eden. They were presented with a choice. A choice. And through that choice, what happened? I need to get, I, I, I was at a CB this morning and I'm like, Jake, me and you, we're going to sit down, we're going to hash this out because you've got more wisdom in your years than I do. And so as I read the story, when they were presented with a choice and they, they, they picked wrong, behind curtain A we have this, and behind curtain B we have this, and they're like, oh, I want this. It was the wrong choice. So the devil, what did he present to them? When they were presented their choice, the devil said, you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Jake, did that happen? No. That's what I thought. I read that again and again. So if you read the account for me, because you grow up in church, and you think you've seen the same thing over and over, and pretty soon it's in your brain, and you're like, that is not what the Bible said. So what did they eat? You know what I used to tell people? They ate an apple. How many people here would say apple? Right? And then I read it, and I'm like, oh, it doesn't say apple. I made that up. We made that up. It says fruit. So for you, didn't we do this before? What's your favorite fruit? If we didn't do it here, it was somewhere else. What's your favorite fruit? Peaches. Peaches? So for you, there would have been a peach in the tree. Anna, what's your favorite fruit? Mango. It would have been a mango <laughs> in the tree. Oranges, land, cars, trucks, power, greed. Name the thing. Joe, there would have been a new shiny crater hanging in the tree. <laughs> Do you know what I mean when we realize that choice? That's when we realize that this, this friend is living and it's alive. Because we can fast forward 6,000 plus years and we can be like, pick the thing. Because that is our choice today, this very hour. And through that choice, what happened? Not that they knew the difference between good and evil. It says in the scripture that their eyes were open and they felt The devil promised them that they would be like God, knowing both good and evil. We are presented with the same choice. Will we doubt the goodness of God's plan for us, for God's purpose for us? Will we simply take the fruit the world offers and be put into a slumber? This is where we shift home stretch. I believe that when we, when we have a conversation, everybody's like, well, that was nice. What do I do with it? And so then I always try to end everything with tools in the toolbox so that when we leave, we feel equipped and then we can take what we've learned or heard and we can actually move it into the application category. So this is what I believe was the tool in the toolbox for me. If you want to live with purpose, with a fulfilled life, the first step would be gaining clearer knowledge of Jesus as he is presented to us in scripture. A good way of doing this Circle, underline this, consistently, I fall off the wagon on consistency, and prayerfully, prayerfully read the Gospels or listen to them, right? I can't read overly well, love to listen. Gospels and then reflect. Sometimes we take in so much information, right? We're trading, we're farming, we're working, cattle, we're doing, we're doing construction, right? Woodworking, we got all this stuff, we're looking at a fruitful instrument, woo! And it's like, oh, when we actually read God's word, make sure we take the time to re reflect on it. Otherwise, it's probably just in and out, and it just becomes more information. 
that we can't do anything with. So make sure we're taking the time to reflect on the teaching of Jesus. As we immerse our minds, right? I read in your bulletin. I'm excited. Is there the people getting baptized? Are they here today? What is baptism? To immerse, right? Yeah, to get baptized. It is to immerse. And I'm like, man, we're, we're baptized every day. You're going to get baptized in that book this afternoon because you're going to immerse yourself in it, right? Our day should be a day of one of baptism on a daily level where we want to immerse ourselves with God and not the distractions of the world. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Okay? So when you guys are looking, it's not like, oh, you know, I, I forget on a daily basis. As we immerse our minds and our hearts in the gospel, two major defining characteristics of his life stand out with striking clarity. Any guesses? Faith and love. Secure in the love of God and his own sonship, Jesus lived with an unshakable trust in his heavenly Father. I'm going to probably read that again because I circled the word sonship and I wrote a footnote. You can be a daughter and a son, an heir to the throne. If you get to know me, I only have 10 messages I bring. I just repeat myself over and over. Um, but that whole sonship and, and daughtership, I don't know if we actually reclaim that. I am not a name and claim a preacher. Bentleys aren't going to fall from the sky. Um, but I do believe that your sonship and your daughtership to the king of kings. If I come and point to that youth, Anna, you're doing it wrong. Do it better. Get better. Or if I said, Anna, do you want to get better for King Jesus? What would you aspire to? Somebody telling you that you are horrible and just a sinner all the time? Yeah, we do. We screw up. We falter. We mess up. But I would sooner go, I want to make King Jesus proud of me, rather than somebody telling me that I'm a no, no good Nick and I won't amount to nothing and I'm just a low life sinner. I don't know if that's going to make me want to do better for King Jesus. <laughs> know your sonship. Uh, Jesus lived with an unshakable trust in his heavenly Father and wholehearted love for God and others. If we want to become like Jesus, faith and love must become the defining characteristics of our lives too. I was just thinking, we, we had a little kind of joke running from Jonah and Michaela's wedding. I seen him this morning and I kind of, kind of was just laughing again or whatever, right? And uh, I just thought, what, what are we doing as we communicate with one another? Are we loving one another for personal gain? Are we for, for status of some kind? Are we loving our relationships just to get to know people more? To maybe learn more from each other? To have fun with our relationships? And I do believe Jesus had fun. He had some struggles for sure with all the people that hated him. But he loved people. And that must have been fun. What is our purpose? Again, if you're a note taker, I want to kind of end with this. I'm going to read one more thing. And I just wrote, what is our purpose? Let's start with faith and love. So as you go from here today, just remember those two things and, and then go on. Um, <clears throat> last, last page here. One of the saddest commentaries, and I don't want to be a downer like you're listening to um, Ecclesiastes, and I believe there's Ecclesiastes, once you're done, and he said hey, everything is meaningless, I'm like, I can take that one or two things. I can be like, well, that's a drag. Or I can be like, oh, I'm going to actually take some of King Solomon's wisdom, and I'm going to apply that to my life, and I'm going to try and reprioritize so that maybe things aren't such a drag. And so this here is this one of the saddest commentaries on the church in the West today, is the weakness of our faith. Secular, secularism, and I put in brackets, the world, has seriously eroded our belief in the almighty, miracle-working God of the Bible, which I believe still exists today. That's a real thing, okay? 
who answers the prayers of his people and intervenes in the affairs of the world. We need to believe that. There's a reason why we have the prime minister we do. There's a reason why there's a president that the U.S. does. We don't need to get down on that. We don't need to get into political debates about it. We can care less if we like it. There's a purpose for it. And we need to pray into that. But lots of times we don't. What do we do? We just, we just complain. We'll just do another laugh in the wilderness complaining instead of praying. We have embraced a reductionism that acknowledges faith in Christ as essential for salvation, but largely ignores the necessity of living by faith thereafter. And I wrote, are we in a slumber? I see so many people, they're like, we want a revival. Yeah, you lead it. No, no. You lead it, you lead it, you lead it, you lead it, you lead it. And pretty soon we will have a revival. Outside of the church. We don't need a revival when we come to church. We're all here for the same reason. More or less, hopefully. Out there is where we need to let our light shine. On a, on a like daily basis. Essential for salvation, but largely ignores the necessity of living by faith thereafter. How many of us really live each day with a confident trust God or trust in God to do what he says he will do. Paul, I don't know if you met my friend Paul yet, he spent the spring helping me uh, see, and, and, and like, he, he's had an interesting walk, and uh, I do learn a lot from him in his calm nature, and he just says, even when we pray, do we wait long enough for God to show up? No, we usually hit go on the microwave, and we want to hear the baby at the end of it. Right? We ask God for something, and if something doesn't happen in about 33 seconds, then we try to do it ourselves. Or if it doesn't happen in a week, or that family has an issue with it, and there's trouble at home, and we pray into it, and we see hardship, and we want it fixed in a year. And God's plan is 15 years. That's tough for us to understand. How many of us take him at his word and act with the expectation that he will be faithful? This is the kind of faith that Jesus calls us to exercise as we seek to follow him. Today, I pray you will be provoked to be purposeful. Provoked. Not everybody will be in my little stubborn human mind, body, once in a while, if Jesus reaches out to me and feels like a little bit of a stop fraud, and he's like, I kind of need you to choose. So choose. I respond to that. Maybe other people don't. Again, some people, Jesus will come and put an arm around you and be like, are you with me? Are we going to walk together? Some people he'll carry. Me, I feel Jesus come alongside me once in a while, and he's like, <laughs> You and me, Parker, we're gonna we're gonna have it out. Cause you're stubborn. And I'm not patient. And I'm low on the grace spectrum. So Jesus, would you work on that in my life? Be on purpose to live out your faith and love for Jesus with all your hearts and love your neighbor as your Um, Isaac, would you like to come close a prayer? And then I think David, you're going to come and do announcements. Yeah.